From the studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles, this is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Thursday, April 30th, 2015. On today's show, we'll commemorate the 40th anniversary of the official end of the Vietnam War with anti-war organizer Paul Crebo and Vietnamese-American community activist and academic Dr. Natalie Newton. Plus, acclaimed author and photographer Richard Ross will join us in studio to discuss his book series, Juvenile Injustice. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Robert Jensen. He's an author and a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. Hi, Bob. Baltimore's police department continues to come under fire in the wake of Freddie Gray's death. This time, it's because the department has decided to not release the internal report of Gray's death to the public. Police Captain Eric Kowalczyk justified the secrecy, saying, quote, the evidence is saved for any kind of prosecution that may or may not happen. Six officers have been suspended with pay in relation to Freddie Gray's arrest and subsequent death. However, police seem to be leaking selective information to the press. The Washington Post was given access to the testimony of an anonymous prisoner who was in the same police van as Gray but separated by a metal wall and concluded that Gray was, quote, banging against the walls and was, quote, intentionally trying to injure himself. Meanwhile, solidarity demonstrations sprung up around the country last night with the largest gatherings taking place in Washington, D.C., Boston, and Minneapolis. In New York, a protest resulted in 60 arrests. Well, Bob, do you believe anything that the police say about pursuing justice and investigating claims of brutality anymore? The Baltimore police are doing everything wrong. Everyone understands that police and prosecutors have a lot of discretion to release information, the results of ongoing investigations, and they tend to do it when it's in their favor. They tend to stymie it when it goes against the, the interests of the police. Uh, I think that if the Baltimore police don't open up more information and conduct a more transparent uh, investigation, this is going to lead to more, not less violence in the streets. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis continues to take strong stands that land him in the news. This week, he called upon the Vatican to release documents related to its role in Argentina's dictatorship. The Pope, who was born in Buenos Aires, has been questioned about his own role in the so-called Dirty War of the 1970s, during which tens of thousands of Argentines were disappeared. His decision to open the Vatican's archives from the era was the result of pressure from families who are still seeking answers to what happened to their loved ones. Pope Francis also spoke out about the equality of women's pay during his Wednesday general audience. He said, why is it a given that women must earn less than men? No, they have the same rights. The disparity is pure scandal. Well, Bob, does Pope Francis continue to surprise you? Surprise me and I think surprise everyone. It was obvious he was going to be a more progressive pope than his predecessor, Benedict, but I think he's gone way beyond the expectations. Now, a lot of people have been angry because he hasn't moved more quickly on certain core issues like the ordination of women. But remember, this is a 2,000-year-old organization that doesn't turn on a dime. I think this call to uh, wage equality might be signaling that the long game for the pope is, in fact, on the status of women in the church, uh, as well as these other questions. Most notably, also this week, we heard about plans for a, a papal encyclical on climate change in the summer that's going to be, I think, extremely important in that movement. Hmm. And finally, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont has officially declared his run for the presidency of the United States. Sanders, one of only two independent senators, has long flirted with the idea of a candidacy. He's come forward to vie for the Democratic Party nomination within weeks of Hillary Clinton declaring her intentions for the White House. Sanders said, quote, I am running in this election to win. He added, we've got a long path forward, referring to the fundraising challenge he will surely face. Already, media pundits are speculating that Sanders' candidacy will be, quote, useful for the Democrats as he presents a foil for Clinton. Clinton gave a speech yesterday with a broad outline of a proposal to end the era of mass incarceration, which escalated via the policies of former President Bill Clinton, although, of course, she made no mention of her husband. Well, Bob, what do you make of Sanders' candidacy and whether he's going to be some kind of foil for Clinton? Well, I, I heard Bernie Sanders speak on a stop in Austin a couple of weeks ago, and I think he's well-intentioned and sincere. Obviously, he doesn't expect to win. But I think Sanders has already squandered some of the opportunities by not making a more forceful critique. If you listen to Bernie Sanders these days, he sounds like a pretty standard New Deal liberal Democrat. He's talking a lot about the middle class, less about the institutionalized disparities in wealth that go way, way further than that. 
I would hope that Bernie Sanders would actually speak in some ways as he claims to be a socialist to speak from a much more critical perspective. Uh, obviously, it's not a, a campaign to win. It's a campaign to change, change the dialogue. And I'd like to see him even more uh, harsh in his denunciation of some of these fundamental structures of power. And any thoughts on Clinton's speech on mass incarceration? Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, the, the term baggage defines so much of the problems of Hillary Clinton. Uh, the baggage of her own history as Secretary of State, for instance, but also, as you point out, the baggage of her association with her husband's administration, which was, you know, the ultimate kind of neoliberal sellout Democratic Party administration. It's going to not be an easy road for Hillary Clinton, even though she's the presumed front runner, as we always hear. Bob Jensen, thanks as always for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Sonali. Robert Jensen is an author and a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin, sitting in for Chenjerai Kumanyika. This is Uprising, and it was exactly a year ago today that we completed our successful Indiegogo campaign to fundraise for the TV production of Uprising. We're very, very grateful to everybody who had donated that time a year ago, and uh, we are on TV now. Hopefully, we'll continue. We'll be right back with the rest of the show. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Forty years ago today, the day that Americans refer to as the fall of Saigon took place in Vietnam, marking the end of the U.S. war in Vietnam. Vietnamese refer to it as Reunification Day or Liberation Day. It was the day that the Viet Cong and other North Vietnamese forces took over the capital of South Vietnam, renaming it from Saigon to Ho Chi Minh City and kicking off a communist-led government. For American anti-war activists, April 30th, 1975 marked the end of a spirited struggle against the U.S. government. The anti-war movement here politicized thousands of young Americans in particular and became a central part of the pantheon of progressive movements birthed during the 1960s and 70s. Among the activists was my guest Paul Kribio, a longtime labor activist, anti-Vietnam War activist, author of Shades of Justice, a memoir. Welcome to Uprising, Paul. Thank you, Sonali. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, um, how, what was your life like before you were politicized by the anti-war movement in uh, the 60s? Can you paint a picture for our audience, um, you know, with the sense that uh, you might have been a sort of typical uh, American politicized by the war? Well, I, <clears throat> I was a typical American. Um, grew up in a family where my dad went to work and my mom stayed home and took care of myself and two younger brothers. Um, and we grew up at a time that, uh, you know, it was, we were still in the Cold War. Um, we were coming out of the McCarthy period. I grew up in the 1950s. I graduated from high school in 1966 and pretty much believed what the government told us. Um, so when it came to uh, increasing involvement in Vietnam, uh, the arguments that they made to the American people were that we needed to go in there and help save the Vietnamese people. We had to go in and help them uh, decide their own future, free from outside influence. And for, you know, most Americans who were raised in a rich tradition of democracy and believing in it, um, that seemed to make sense. Mm. And and did um, the uh, racial discrimination that you witnessed in your community and city around the time, and also the burgeoning, burgeoning civil rights movement, uh, play a role in how you saw the Vietnam War? 
Well, it did. Uh, <clears throat> I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Um, it was at that time a very heavily industrialized city. Um, and on the east side of the city was the black community. And uh, when you went uh, on the east side of Buffalo, you would see um, really glaring and stark differences in the condition of housing. Um, we knew that uh, unemployment w was much higher among African Americans. <clears throat> so clearly, um, I knew that all of the grand sounding things that the U.S. government said about our country, um, there was something not really quite right. We weren't really getting the whole picture. So how did you first become involved in the anti-war movement? And I'm assuming you were actually a draft age uh, at the time that you became politicized. Yes. <clears throat> um, like I say, initially I, <clears throat> excuse me, believed what the government told us. Um, but as I started seeing pictures on television of uh, U.S. troops uh, marching through villages in Vietnam, burning down um, people's homes, um, dead bodies of men, women, and children on the ground, uh, seeing pictures of literally carpet bombing of whole villages in Vietnam. Um, this was shocking to me, and it really jarred with the image that we were given of our government. Mm -hmm. And so this was the beginning of my, of starting to rethink um, you know, really what our government was telling us and, um, you know, what was going in Vietnam, going on in Vietnam. And you decided to go to Canada rather than risk uh, jail time for not wanting to go into the Army? Yeah, there was some other, yeah, that combined with, um, I remember uh, I had a, a friend in high school who was a star baseball player on the varsity team, and my last image of him was um, hitting a home run in one of the varsity baseball games. He got drafted. Uh, he was a year ahead of me in high school. He got drafted, sent to Vietnam, and a year and a half later, he was back home paralyzed in a wheelchair for life. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> all of those things uh, made me believe that we weren't being told the truth about Vietnam. And I moved to Canada in 1968 um, uh, really to uh, avoid the draft and refuse to fight in Vietnam, so I consider myself a war resister. And then you had an, an industrial accident and came back to the U.S., was released from your obligation of the Army and became involved in the movement full-fledged? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, when I came back, I uh, started taking classes at the University of Buffalo, um, first night classes because I was working during the day. And, um, you know, there I was introduced to a very powerful anti-war movement led by Students for a Democratic Society. Uh, and combined with what I was learning at the campus and my own reading, I read in a very important book called Vietnam, Vietnam by Felix Green. Um, that and my own personal experiences led me to become an anti-war activist. And first and foremost, I got involved in the Buffalo Draft Resistance Union. So to describe for our audience what the participation in the movement looked like, what it felt like. You must have marched and organized. I mean, this was before the days of the Internet. The Internet wasn't even a spark in someone's imagination. Yeah, maybe it was somewhere, but uh, nobody really, you know, uh, you didn't have the kind of instant communication we have today. And so organizing was just a different kind of thing. Well, the way we organized then was this was back in the day of the old mimeograph machine. Yeah. Um, probably a lot of people today aren't familiar with that, but um, we would crank out leaflets on a hand-cranked uh, mimeograph machine and then go and pass them out everywhere. Hmm. And what did those, uh, you know, what, what sorts of um, demands were being made? What, uh, the, the culture of the 60s and 70s organizing was a very distinct culture. Anti-war activism had its own sort of influence in the culture that's still, um, you know, apparent today. And I'm wondering if you can give our, our, our audience a sense of um, what it felt like for you to be part of that movement. The sense that I got, and it, I think it maybe originated on a lot of the college campuses, but then it spread beyond that into the broader community, and that was one of, I think, real deep and serious questioning of what our government was saying and doing, and a rejection on the part, especially of a lot of the young people of my generation, of really rejecting that, rejecting this whole idea that might makes right that in order to solve disputes, we have to go to war and kill people, um, that, 
you know, really the system of capitalism, which we increasingly saw as uh, an exploitative system where um, one person's success would be another person's failure. Um, many of us began to question all of these things and created a whole uh, subculture um, yeah. with our own art and music. And uh, it was a very exciting time, and I think it had an impact way beyond um, just our generation, it really had an influence uh, throughout society. Right. I mean, you know, many people associate Bob Dylan and John Lennon and uh, all of these very well-known celebrity musicians who aligned themselves with the movement. Um, and then sort of fast forward to April 30th, 1975, when the fall of Saigon happened, when the war officially ended. Many uh, people today uh, might attribute the end of the Vietnam War to the raucous spirit and organized anti-war activism that you were involved in. But others say that it was really the Vietnamese themselves who drove the U.S. out. What do you think? Well, I think first and foremost it was the Vietnamese, and we need to, you know, recognize that and uh, respect that uh, history. They went through tremendous suffering. Um, over three million Vietnamese were killed, five million wounded. Um, many millions more affected by Agent Orange, which still the third generation children yes. today are suffering from in Vietnam. I was on a trip in 2011 uh, to Vietnam, and we visited a hospital where there was a whole ward um, set up to take care of third generation victims of Agent Orange. Um, but <clears throat> in, on April 30th, uh, 1975, uh, for many of us in the anti-war movement, it was really a, the end of a chapter, and it was a relief that, you know, thank goodness the war is finally over. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people who were involved in the anti-war movement went on to do many other things during that period. Um, I, most all of my friends that were involved, none of them uh, really changed their fundamental beliefs. They went on and did other things in life. But they were profoundly affected, as I was, by that period, and it really shaped us and made us who we are, and we have not given up those ideals. And what is your life? I mean, I hate to ask you to uh, put your, the last 40 years of your life in a nutshell on this <laughs> interview, but what has, how, how deeply has the last 40 years of your life been influenced by your years of an anti-war, of being an anti-war activist? Well, at the time that I was getting involved in the anti-war movement, I also um, worked, and in Buffalo it was a very heavily industrialized city at the time, and I worked in uh, the auto industry. It was an auto parts company that I worked in. And uh, when I saw the way people were treated on the job, uh, and I saw the union sticking up for them, I immediately gravitated to the union and, and got involved in the union and ultimately became a uh, active in the union most of my life, ultimately uh, in 1985 becoming a full-time union representative. But I saw a parallel between what was happening in Vietnam, the discrimination and abuse of the Vietnamese people, uh, and the discrimination and abuse of workers um, in too many jobs. Um, they were similar. I mean, clearly what was happening in Vietnam was much more serious. Um, but, but it was a similar dynamic, and the political forces and economic forces were the same. Yeah. Um, my understanding, as I studied more about Vietnam, was the United States did not go in there to um, protect the rights of the South Vietnamese people. Um, if they really believed that, they would have abided by the Geneva Accords of 1954, mm -hmm. which ended a hundred years of French colonial oppression in Vietnam. There were supposed to have been elections to reunite the country in 1956 in the U.S. Um, through supporting a hand-picked uh, individual that they put in power in South Vietnam. They called off these elections. And Eisenhower later wrote in a book, Mandate for Change, I've never corresponded with anybody knowledgeable in Indochinese affairs who does not agree that if those elections would have been held, probably 80% of the people would have voted for the communist Ho Chi Minh. So if our government is telling us that we are for democracy, how can they then claim that it's okay to go in and overthrow a government and, and repress elections, which would have allowed the Vietnamese people to make a democratic choice. Yeah.
And then finally, um, 40 years later, uh, you've continued your anti-war activism, specifically on Vietnam, by also um, being involved in working for reparations for the Vietnamese. What, how serious an issue is this, and, and how do you make the case to Americans that Vietnam deserves reparations? Yeah. Well, it's actually a very huge uh, issue. Um, when we were in Vietnam uh, in March of uh, 2011, um, we toured the entire country, but uh, repeatedly our Vietnamese hosts, and it was the Vietnam Women's Union that uh, hosted our trip, um, they would, uh, you know, talk to us about the legacy of the war. And one of the most serious problems was this problem of Agent Orange. Um, not only are there still people suffering from its effects, um, getting cancer, heart disease, diabetes, many other diseases, um, children being born with very serious birth defects, um, and much of the land and water uh, still poisoned by Agent Orange and dioxin uh, specifically, which is the most toxic uh, poison known to science to date. Um, these are all important issues for the Vietnamese. and. We had discussions about it, and they said the United States at the end of the war made a pledge to make some reparations to Vietnam. There's been a little bit of cleanup of some of the sites where Agent Orange was stored and used, but very little. I mean, it's the tip of the iceberg. Much more needs to be done. So there are various organizations. There's an Agent Orange Relief and Responsibility Campaign, which I'm involved with. Uh, we have a bill in Congress uh, to uh, help make reparations not only for the Vietnamese that have suffered, but also American soldiers that have suffered from Agent Orange. And that's really, and this was started by uh, Vietnam veterans. So that's our segue to the American people, is to talk about initially American soldiers that were exposed to this. Um, many of them also got cancer and died early. Some have had children that have been born with uh, birth defects and other health ailments because of Agent Orange. And so our fight is to uh, make sure that the fight to help U.S. service members that uh, suffered in Vietnam, we have to make sure that that's combined with helping the Vietnamese. We can't leave them behind because they suffered much, much more than we did. Well, Paul, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing some of these thoughts on thank, this anniversary. Thank you, Sonelli. My guest, Paul Creviel, is a longtime labor activist, anti-Vietnam War activist, and author of Shades of Justice, a memoir. This is Uprising. We'll continue our coverage of this anniversary after this break. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. Continuing our coverage of the 40th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War and its aftermath, we turn now to the Vietnamese American community in the U.S. The fall of Saigon precipitated a massive evacuation of U.S. servicemen and South Vietnamese out of the country. It was the largest helicopter eva evacuation in history. And in the years following the end of the war, about two million more Vietnamese left by boat, earning the moniker Boat People. Many died at sea and others ended up in refugee camps, a good portion of whom made their way to the U.S. Today, they make up the fourth largest group of immigrants of Asian origin in the U.S., clustering in California and Texas in particular. My guest is Dr. Natalie Newton, Vietnamese-American progressive activist and research affiliate at UC Irvine, who's worked on uh, deportation, sexual violence, LGBT justice, and also the Trans-Pacific. Partnership. She sits on the executive board of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, and her research in Vietnam won a Fulbright scholarship and a national award from the American Anthropological Association. She's also taught Asian American studies at Cal State Fullerton. Welcome to Uprising, Natalie. Thank you for having me, Simone. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, first, um, is it fair to say that the Vietnam War and the way it ended is the primary reason for why um, uh, the reason f uh, for the presence of most Vietnamese Americans today, at least? 
least you know those who have been here for a while. Yes, absolutely. Um, the United States Census does record a, a few hundred uh, Vietnamese immigrants to the United States prior to the war mm -hmm. who are students studying abroad, but predominantly most of the Vietnamese American, which is now three generations in the United States, are here because of the war. Mm -hmm. And how do most Vietnamese view their home country? Um, there is, we know, a strong sense of anti-communism, which is understandable given the history. Yeah, I think that there are I think there, there's three main clusters of thought around um, how folks view Vietnam. Um, of course, there's a dominant viewpoint that Vietnam is a communist country and it's this bitterness of leaving a, a, a state that betrayed them and so refugees are across the world in the diaspora. There's also a narrative of a lot of folks going back and you know, creating entertainment and music industry ties through hmm. Paris by Night, for example, which is a hugely popular variety show, and also other business transactions with um, coffee and other, um, you know, electronics and other companies um, in Vietnam and the United States. And there's also folks who, like myself, second generation, who go back to Vietnam and try to understand the homeland, you know, from, from our own points of view, not just the stories that were told from older generations. Hmm. Can you share with us the story of your own family? Yes, of course. Um, so my family, my parents came to the United States um, in the mid-70s, and my father was twice a refugee um, from the north um, to the south so when he was a child. So they were part of the exodus after the fall of Saigon? Um, so, yeah, after, so after the fall of Saigon, they were the part of the first wave, mm -hmm. and my dad, um, prior to coming to the United States, was also a refugee within his own country um, after the Viet Minh, uh, took over the the northern part of Vietnam. Um, they successfully ousted the French, and then the and the country was divided. So he fled with his country when he was a child in the 50s, and then came to the United States after after the the American War ended. My mother's side um, is from the Mekong Delta, and they were a family of herbalists and tr tailors. And so they um, they came to the U.S. with my older sister, who mm -hmm. um, would be considered 1.5 generation because she was um, a child when she came to the U.S. And I was born in the U.S. in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So um, is there a generational divide today, and you alluded to it earlier, between young Vietnamese born in the U.S. and their parents who still remember their home country? Yeah, I think, you know, it's yes and no. I think that a lot of folks um, in the older generation um, don't want to talk about Vietnam and the war trauma is still very present, present and they also have a, they cling to the pre-1975 memories of Vietnam. So the Vietnam that my parents knew is totally different than the Vietnam that I know. Um, going back, doing research, being privileged enough to go and, and engage with the youth there in Saigon and Hanoi. And so I think that folks, there is a divide, but there's also a lot of solidarity with the younger generation where um, the United Vietnamese Student Association, for example, who organized a lot of um, Black April events, Black April meaning the fall of Saigon and, and how the diaspora sees uh, April 30th. Um, and there's a lot of um, memories that are being re uh, re-perpetuated in the younger generation too. So I, I sort I, of oral histories passed exactly, down from exactly. parents to children. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a mix um, so of folks who you know preserve that history and also folks who want to learn a different history and um, and go back to Vietnam to to see what's happening in the modern day. Yeah. I want to talk about some issues that are impacting the Vietnamese American immigrant community here. Despite the fact that there is a high rate of naturalization among uh, the in the community, there's also, I understand, undocumented immigrants who are newer immigrants, some of whom have actually been uh, deported back to Vietnam. Some are fighting deportation. Can you explain the politics of the U.S. deporting immigrants back to Vietnam in the uh, historical context of the war? Yeah. So after the war, um, my understanding is that the Vietnamese government uh, did not allow folks to come back to the country um, if they were deported. So they so if they left the country. Correct, yeah. correct. And then they were expatriated back to Vietnam. They wouldn't yeah. allow them. So you can have dual citizenship, for example. So Bill Clinton signed a, a memorandum of agreement in 1997, I believe, um, and he um, basically normalized diplomatic relations between Vietnam and the United States. So that meant that Vietnam had to take um, uh, deportees back. So. In 2008, there was another memorandum of agreement that um, said approximately a few thousand um, um, undocumented immigrants in the United States had to be then depo deported. Mm -hmm. And so I was involved in some community organizing in Seattle, which was at the time like the third, uh, the city with the third largest Vietnamese population on the West Coast. 
So we organized around um, in solidarity with a lot of the Latino communities who were already doing a lot of work around deportation and, and knowing your rights and, and whatnot to educate the community on, on what to do. I mean, these are, these are undocumented immigrants who were paying taxes their whole life. They were just not categorized as refugees because the United States closed the doors in 1992. So refugees are legal status and they, they didn't make the cut but their, their experiences were exactly the same as every other refugee in terms of multiple migrations across the oceans and coming to the United States um, you know, without family or without resources, and, but they just weren't on paper refugees and therefore um, undocumented and, and illegitimized hmm. immigrants. And so. sent back to Vietnam. Correct. Yeah. Another issue that the Vietnamese community here in the U.S. struggles with is domestic violence. Uh, uh, how serious is this problem and what progress has been made through social justice and anti-violence activism? Yeah, so um, the Asian Pacific uh, Islander Institute for Domestic Violence, they put out a report um, just recently that said that 31% um, of Vietnamese immigrant families um, um, women experience intimate partner violence in their homes just wow. this last year. So wow, that's a third. Yeah, one in three. That's just what's reported as yeah. well. I mean, there's a lot of folks who don't speak out or don't really define what they experience as violence per se um, because of what people understand as emotional violence or, you know, mm -hmm. um, whatnot. So, so that compares to my understanding of, of the API community, about 40 to 60 percent in the API community broadly. Um, which is almost double other ethnic groups. Um, and again, that's just what's reported. Um, How so, do you understand that, those levels? Well, I think that, well, firstly, I think that that study is, is done by the API Domestic Violence Institute, so it's probably, you know, the communities that they had engaged with. But I also feel like uh, what is understood about the family, for example, the word for domestic violence in Vietnamese is um, which literally means family abuse, and in order to combat it, people talk about um, undermining or just challenging what it means to have a good family and the role that women play in maintaining the harmony of the family. And, um, and there's a lot of responsibility put on women to assuage um, conflict or to, to carry the burden of, of, you know, what the children and, and, and the father and the family and this kind of patriarchal Confucian structure mm -hmm. will, yeah. will withstand. So, Vietnamese immigrants in the U.S., uh, particularly women, dominate the nail industry. And I'd love to talk about that briefly. There was a documentary uh, recently called Nailed It about the origins of the Vietnamese uh, nail industry in the U.S. Uh, but uh, this is also an industry that does have a lot of health and labor issues, which we don't often think about when we go and get a pedicure. Yeah. Uh, how important are these issues? Um, so my understanding is from the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, which is a nonprofit that works on the state and national level on um, nail salon pub as a public nail salons as a public health issue and a labor issue. They talk about um, it, it, the number one health issue is allergies from all of the toxins that are in um, in in, in the, chemicals. In the cl chemical products like the nail polish, the nail cleaners, everything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's there's also people have back problems just bending over for multiple hours a day. A lot of the women who work in the nail salons are also family of the owners, and so it's hard to negotiate something like you know a fair labor practice of like eight hours a day and you get two breaks and a lunch. You know it, it's it's your family you're working for your 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 mother-in-law whatnot, and so working on weekends is like not a question because uh, you know it's connected to the domestic violence and human trafficking issue too. Um, and where, you know, 28 percent of Vietnamese um, women in the United States know somebody who's been abused by their in-law. Hmm. So you have a complicated family structure where maybe uh, a man may have married a woman from Vietnam and the mother-in-law is also kind of running the household and running the business in some way. And so the, the migrant woman may feel obligated to work you know, unnecess like unnecessarily long hours or, you know, this affects like childbirth issues and pregnancy and miscarriages and whatnot. So there's, it's very multiply intertwined with being an economic refugee as, as much as it is um, 
a, um, a, a member of a family that has a working business. Mm -hmm. so. On the issue of labor, there's also the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a sort of international labor issue, and you've worked on, on this is a major free trade treaty that the U.S. is attempting to fast track into law, working with a number of governments around the country, but also notably the government of Vietnam. How important is it for labor rights, both in the U.S. and in Vietnam, um, that, that, uh, that the TPP you know, really should be focused on? It's absolutely critical. Um, um, TPP is like NAFTA times 12, <laughs> um, I think, in some ways. Um, so TPP is an agreement with over 600 corporations around the world um, to sometimes bypass international labor laws that have been in place. Um, and the public um, doesn't even know what the text of the TPP is right now. We don't have access, you know, the Except members Except for of, some leaked documents. Uh, some leaked documents. I mean, c some members of Congress sometimes don't even have access to this. And so Vietnam is one of the countries whose government has signed on to, to yes, we want the TPP. We want corporations to invest in our country. And I think, um, but it's interesting to see the ways that the workers have also responded to this as compared to the to the government because in earlier this, this month, um, you know, for one week, thousands of workers um, went on strike at, at, at Nike and, Adi and an, uh, at a factory that made shoes for Nike and Adidas. So a in, um, Vietnam? in, in Saigon, they mm -hmm. marched um, on Highway 1, which is the only freeway in Vietnam. But um, and we're talking about like 80,000 workers who work for that factory. Wow. Um, and they success. So they, they, they went on strike for a week. And what they were fighting for was um, if you if you quit, you're supposed to get some kind of like unemployment, and the government was going to change the law to appease this corporation um, to to say that you can't get that that little bit of money until after you retire. So the workers um, went on strike saying that we need that money to be able to hold ourselves over for the next job until we get the next job, right? So they went on strike for seven days straight, and um, they successfully got the government to pay out. Hmm. And it's interesting, uh, Vietnam's communist government, of course, uh, now in a partnership in multiple fronts with the United States. Finally, you've also worked on LGBT issues in the Vietnamese and immigrant communities. And what's interesting is Vietnam itself, the government of Vietnam, the home country, has uh, been actually a leader in Asia on the international LGBT rights seen a gay marriage ban in Vietnam was struck down in January. Has that attitude sort of permeated among immigrant communities here? It's very interesting because um, I actually don't really see it permeating mm -hmm. as much. Um, it's very complicated because I think that a lot of organ a lot of community leaders view any kind of alliance politically with Vietnam as, as communist, um, even though it's interesting how the Communist Party also demonizes homosexuality as like Western and capitalist. So it's like this <laughs> contradiction. But interesting. but um, I was involved in a lot of the community organizing in 2013. Um, that that news went that went national to the BBC and Voice of America around um, inclusion of LGBTs into the largest public gathering of Vietnamese diasporics outside of Vietnam in one public place, which is the Lunar New Year Parade in Little Saigon in Orange County. And at that time, that was when a lot of the headlines were um, that, you know, is, is, is Hanoi more progressive than Little Saigon, Orange County, because they were going to strike down the ban against same-sex marriage. And a lot of the... Meanwhile in Orange County, they were going to stop exactly. the LGBT contingent Correct. from marching. Who had already marched three years in a row mm. prior to that. So I think it's complicated because, firstly, in Vietnam, a lot of the buzz in English language news was that... Um, you know, Vietnam is going to be the first Asian country to allow same-sex marriage, which wasn't actually true because we had they had like laws that prohibited same-sex marriage. And there's also laws that do other things. For example, um, transgender women can't be in beauty pageants in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so it's the Vietnam's image right now is is very much a media like these NGOs use the media specifically to create more positive images in Vietnam. So I did research with with them and also community organizers who are combating um, some of the NGOization of LGBT rights in Vietnam. But on the other hand, in the United States, we were also using the media to to kind of bring attention to this injustice in Orange County. And it was very complicated because we, as the Vietnamese American community organizers, didn't want to be um, red baited as communists because we had already been in the previous years. And um, to say to make any kind of connection to put pressure on the Vietnamese American leaders of the parade. I think would have alienated our allies who were in the Vietnamese community already, who supported us as 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 the LGBT contingent, and so it's not necessarily like 
the homeland politics, it's, it's, it, it's really the censorship, I think, that of some of the progressive leaning folks in the community um, who knew about what was happening in Hanoi and, 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 and uh, like the 17 gay pride parades that have happened since 2013. So I think it's in Vietnam, like, and, mm. and it's, it's interesting, you know, so. Well, I want to thank you so much, uh, Natalie, for joining us today and helping to discuss, uh, and taking us on a whirlwind tour of some <laughs> of the most important <laughs> issues facing the Vietnamese American community and connections yes. with Vietnam. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. My guest, Dr. Natalie Newton, is a Vietnamese American progressive activist and research affiliate at UC Irvine. She sits on the board of the executive and the executive board of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. She's taught Asian American studies at Cal State Fullerton. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It is a shameful fact in the United States that we imprison children. The U.S. actually locks up more young people at a greater rate than any other industrialized nation. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars on locking up minors far more than we do on educating youth. We send black and brown kids to prison far more often for the same infractions as white kids. And we ensure that imprisoned youth are far more likely to end up back in prison than if they were never arrested. It's one, of these, it's one thing to hear these facts and figures, but it's another thing to see the children themselves locked in barbaric conditions, isolated from the world, many struggling with mental health problems. My guest Richard Ross has seen incarcerated American kids firsthand and has photographed them to help draw attention to their plight. Richard Ross is an acclaimed photographer, researcher, and distinguished professor of art at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he, his most recent work is the Injustice series, which documents the lives of incarcerated juveniles. The series includes Juvenile Injustice and Girls Injustice. His earlier book is entitled Architecture of Authority, a collection of photos of architectural spaces that exert power over the individuals within them. Very pleased to welcome Richard Ross to our studios. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, first, tell us about this series, and I should mention it's in space justice. Two separate words, not injustice, but in justice. Uh, how did it start? What drew you to this issue? Uh, I was photographing a project, Architecture of Authority, and then as part of it, I was in El Paso, Texas, and spoke to a, a juvenile prosecutor uh, in a detention center, and I asked him if I ever thought he would be so successful that he would be out of business. And he said, not as long as the state of Texas keeps on making 10-year-olds. And then a little research found that 22 states and the District of Columbia will uh, try children as adults as young as seven. So once I started doing that research, I was off and running, just saying that this is an impossible situation that has to be explored. Hmm. Uh, tell us about the, the photographs in your book. Uh, the first book is Juvenile Injustice. The second one focuses specifically on girls, girls injustice. And since they're minors, you don't, you can't show, you don't show their faces. H how do you photograph these kids? I sit on the floor of the cells and I talk to them for about an hour, uh, which is an unusual event for them to have somebody old, white, knocking on the door of their cell, taking off their shoes, sitting on the floor and asking for permission to come in. And then after about an hour, there's a bit of a bond established of somebody that's giving them respect. And then we work as co-collaborators or co-conspirators to do an image where their face isn't showing. I have to sign an MOU usually to make sure that the kid's face isn't showing, which also acts to take away the identity of the child and have any viewer or reader look at it and say, well, I don't have to worry about that kid because it's not my kid. Now, the conditions that many of them are locked up in, as your book shows, are just 
horrible. Some kids are in tiny cells. Some are completely isolated. Uh, some receive everything, including meals, through a, a slot in the door. Uh, can you paint a picture for our audience? I think you've done a pretty accurate job of painting it. <laughs> it's really no place for kids, and these kids are uh, to learn, to grow, to thrive, they have to be social animals. Uh, when they do something wrong, uh, you may get annoyed with your kid, but you don't put them in a closet for an hour, a week, uh, which we do with some of these kids. We put them in isolation rooms for extended periods of time. Essentially solitary confinement. Yeah, and that's a practice that goes on way too much. I mean, these rooms are, uh, many of them, completely featureless. I mean, that could obviously drive adults to insanity, but kids especially who need stimulation, how does it impact their mental health if they weren't mentally ill to begin with? Oh, at least three quarters of these kids need mental health services, and it, there's no question about it, it destroys these kids. It, it's not nothing less than that. Now, why are these kids locked up when so many of them are struggling with mental illness? Shouldn't they be getting treatment? So, some of your photographs show um, kids who have cut themselves on their arms. Is, is, that, is that a common feature? It's common. I mean, a lot of these kids suffer from depression. I'll go to one institution, and 10% of the, them are getting uh, psychotropic medications. Mm -hmm. I'll go to another institution, and the percentage is 90%. So there's really no standard here, and there's no... Just numbers like that tell me that something's wrong. Uh, but we're not, we're punishing these kids. We're not really treating them. So they're locked up, and then they're also medicated, heavily medicated. Locked up. Uh, many of them are medicated. Um, they're, we're very good on retribution. We're not really good on rehabilitation. And these institutions aren't really good at deterrence. And about 88% of these kids are in there for nonviolent crimes. And such as? Such as uh, their status offenders, so they're truant and they get locked up. If you or I don't go to school, oh, okay, we're cutting classes. If these kids don't go to school, it's a crime. Uh, or else a lot of, especially the girls are from abusive homes, so they run away because they're sane, and when they run away, they're AWOL, which is a status offense, and then they get locked up for doing something to survive. Let's talk about the girls, uh, specifically the second in your series, Girls in the Juvenile Justice System. The book is called Girls in Justice, and um, you photographed them. You also have essays, uh, not only your own essay, but essays by people like Marion Wright Edelman. What additional struggles do girls specifically deal with? And you talk about how the majority of them are sexually abused and victimized. Uh, it's not hyperbole to say that not the majority, all of them. All of them. Yeah, when you go into these institutions, you just hear, you speak to every girl, and at what age were you first sexually abused? Mm -hmm. You have to take it for granted. So these are all uh, kids that you have to look through through the lens of trauma and look at them as victims. But we simply don't do that. And you write that uh, in one meeting with a girl, you, rather than her tell you her story, you told her what you imagined would be her story just based on the countless girls that you've talked to and it was pretty close to home. Uh, yeah, I mean, many of the kids uh, are teenagers. Once they are given a little of attention, they want to give it back. But occasionally I'll get a girl uh, that's reticent to speak, and then I'll just sit on the floor and say, for example, uh, many of the girls in here have been sexually abused. Someone they were supposed to trust, they couldn't trust. A parent didn't parent. Caregiver didn't care. And they were... Uh, they ran away from home, they ended up on the street, they met an older man, uh, they exchanged sex for survival, for food, for housing, and then I'll go on and spin the narrative and I'll say, uh, is there any difference between this story and yours? And the girl would respond, yeah, I don't have two siblings, I have three. They're just that endlessly, uh, they can numb you after a while, but you can't afford to be numbed by them. How do you get access to these places that imprison youth? I mean, first of all, not many Americans are aware of this, but I can't imagine that the authorities like the idea of you going in and photographing and exposing the barbarity, or do they not realize how barbaric this is? Uh, there are a lot of people in the system that want to correct it, mm. that they're shackled by the uh, habits of the institution and they see it's wrong but they can't do it, and some of them are subversive enough to want to invite me, and those are rare. 
but in many cases, people don't understand the power of the context of photography. And I'll wear my university researcher hat, I'll wear my journalistic hat, and I grew up in New York, so I'm relentless when it comes to doing something like this, because there are lives in the balance, and you can't afford to accept no for an answer. A lot of the kids in the photographs that you um, have in your book are in fetal positions. They're slumped over, they're curled up, their bodies are bent over like they want to disappear. How important is it for us to read their body language? Oh, their body language is very important. When I started doing this, I went to an institution in the Midwest and I said to a sympathetic director, I said, I want to go through the same procedure a kid does. So I was mugged, booked, and I spent 24 hours in solitary, which they do for every kid coming into the system. And just, re just as a matter of course, they put a kid in solitary for 24 hours? At a minimum. That's just to start with, right that's away. That's assessment and evaluation. They wow. want to make sure that the kid isn't a um, predator or prey. They want to check on gang affiliation. So the easiest thing to do is put them in solitary. Often they're in a suicide tunic in some institutions, which is like a moving blanket, uh, and there's nothing in the room. So I did that for 24 hours, and I ended up in a fetal position. I ended up virtually crying. It was brutal as an adult, and I knew that I could press a button and be released at any time, uh, or I, I knew that I had a limit of 24 hours. But these kids are as young as uh, 10, and they don't know. They are incarcerated on the worst day of their lives. And sometimes, especially the girls, are taken into custody for protection, allegedly. And rather than being put in a foster home or a shelter, they're put in detention to keep them safe. And those are in big quotes. So these are brutal conditions for kids, and they're really debilitating. Of course they're going to be in fetal positions. They've got nothing else. What? Uh, age, uh, what is the youngest age you have encountered in your work? Uh, probably a fourth and fifth grader. So uh, the majority of the kids are 15, 16, 17. But some of them are incredibly young and incredibly fragile. I think the kid on the screen is an 11-year-old mm -hmm. in a juvenile detention center. For our TV audience, why do you do what you do, Richard. I mean, you alluded to this earlier that uh, you can't afford to, to get numb. Uh, once I started doing it and realized what was at stake, uh, the question is how do I stop it? Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, really obvious once you're able to act as a conduit for the voices of these kids where they have no voices from families with no resources, from communities with no power, uh, it's real easy to see why I do it. The larger issue is, I'm 68 years old and exhausted. How do I stop doing this? I've been doing this for nine or 10 years. And it just is becomes a calling. It's a, a drive to keep on doing more and listen to more kids and act as their voice. What, ho what change do you hope will come from exposing these uh, conditions to the world. I, I recall the, a book that someone did years ago, a photographer, where they simply photographed the last meals of death row prisoners. And just that, I, those images served to humanize the people we were killing. How do you hope people will take your books? I give, I license my work at no cost to uh, nonprofits. So they do great work, they've got great ideas, they do the research, they've got the data. My work, I give them so that they can uh, share with policymakers and enforcement and judges that there are lives at stake. So your work is a very, essentially your art is a, is a specifically um, and purposefully political tool that you want it to be. Completely. I'm very um, focused on what it can do. I, have, I understand the limitations of my own work. I don't do the data research. But I'm an artist, I'm a human being, and I'm a visualist, and I've created a library of these kids. 
I want to uh, go back to what you started out saying in, in the story of how you were drawn to this issue in the first place. Your work with your earlier book, Architecture of Authority, was also very fascinating to me. You photographed architectural spaces from all over the world with a common theme, I understand, of essentially how people are controlled by these spaces. But you feature, for example, the inter interrogation room in Guantanamo and a hotel lobby in Germany in the same series. Why are those two sort of seemingly uh, disparate spaces uh, part of uh, the same series? Well, uh, context is made to provoke. So uh, an upscale hotel in Germany where there's a giant mirror on the ceiling which houses a security camera uh, implies that we're all subject to a certain amount of surveillance. And the cell in Guantanamo was perfect for architectural authority. I repurposed that cell in Guantanamo and put it next to a juvenile detention center in El Paso, and they're identical wow. architectural units with the difference that Guantanamo has a window and the juvenile detention center that I sister it with uh, doesn't have a window. Wow, so there's some clear continuity here. Yeah, I mean, my uh, everything builds on what you've done before. Yeah. And, yeah. How, how uh, can social media and ordinary people who might not be working in nonprofits, uh, but who are so moved by what they're hearing and seeing uh, and want to proliferate your images, how can they do that? Can they go to your website, share your images, et cetera? Thank you. You're terrific. Uh, yes, uh, juvenileinjustice.com with hyphens between in, uh, juvenile-in-justice.com is the website. And we push out at least once a week stories of each kid in a first-person voice. Uh, and also I've been doing sound recordings of them as well. So you actually listen to the kids speaking and telling their story. Wow, and they allow you to record their voices. Authorities I, allow you to I'm really, I'm pushing this one to no, to no limits at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, images give a certain authority and a certain voice, but the interviews, again, the text is important, but as you know with radio and TV, when you hear the sounds of these really fragile voices, it's a veracity that's undeniable. Juvenile-in-justice.com is the website. Richard, thank you so much for the important work that you do. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. My guest, Richard Ross, is an acclaimed photographer, researcher, and distinguished professor of art at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His most recent work is a series called Juvenile Injustice. This is Uprising. Bipasha Shom is our senior producer. Anna Bus is our assistant producer. Christian Beck is our production coordinator. Alexander Hobbs is our technical director. Corinne Gaston is our research intern. Federico Garcia is our audio engineer. Annie Mendoza is our social media coordinator. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Uprising with Sonali. Our website is uprisingwithsonali.com. Our theme music is by Quetzal. I'm Sonali Kohatkar, host and executive producer of Uprising. I'll see you next time.